بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الكريم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا رسول الله with the name of Allah the most gracious the most compassionate verily all praise belongs to Allah the peace and blessings be upon his final prophet and messenger I declare openly that none is worthy of worship except Allah alone and I declare openly that Muhammad is his final prophet and messenger sallallahu alaihi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Welcome to today's discussion on the dangers of the dunya. To begin, we would like to refer to a very beautiful saying of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, at dunya says mu'min wa jannatul kafir, that the material world and all that it comprises, it is a prison for the believer and it is paradise for the disbeliever. This saying of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, puts the material world in the proper perspective for the Muslim. Indeed, we have been created from the material earth, from dust and from clay, and we have evolved or grown into this life with a need for material things. However, throughout the text of Islam, the Quran, and the authentic hadith of the Prophet وسلم, we find that it is necessary to put the dunya and our relationship with it, that is the material world and our relationship with it, in its proper perspective, or else we may be among the losers. This material world and everything in it has the li'an of Allah. So this means that we should not put too much emphasis on the material world, on the acquisition of wealth or the acquisition of property, because these things, while they in, them, in and of themselves are not harmful or evil, but it is the way that we use them and the extent to which we go after them that can determine whether or not they will be a curse for us and a harm for us. MashaAllah Ta'ala. So when we remember what the Prophet has said, that for the Muslim and for the believer, this material world is a prison for us, we have to reflect on just exactly uh, what does that mean. When we say that this material world is a prison for the believer, this is telling us that as a Muslim, I have to live within certain limits. I can't just do what I want to do, or what my desires tell me to do. We know that Islam is governed by the code of the Sharia or the Islamic law, the laws of Almighty God Allah. And we know that it is only Allah who has the authority and the right to legislate and to make laws. So, as a Muslim, because I want to please Allah, I will not allow myself to do those things that are displeasing to Him. I will not allow the material world to become my sole source of happiness and fulfillment. In fact, this material world is no more than an amusement and a mirage, as Allah tells us in the Quran. So how would it be if we put all of our emphasis on this material world, on this dunya, when in fact Allah holds this material world in such, such little esteem? It's very, very meaningless to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, one day the prophet was walking with his companions and they passed by a dead animal. And he asked his companions, who among them would like to purchase this dead carcass? And the carcass, in fact, had some mutilation or some deficiencies in it. Even before it had died, it had some form of 
deficiency that people would not have even wanted to buy it in the marketplace. Here, the prophet is asking his companions, would they like to buy this dead carcass even with a deficiency? And of course, the companion said, no, messenger of Allah, why would we want to buy something like this? He told them, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, that the material world and everything that is in it means less to Allah than that dead carcass to them. Allahu Akbar. So why is it that we as Muslims find it so difficult to give in zakat and to give sadaqah when Allah has commanded us to give freely of that which we love? Why is it that we find Muslims committing masiyah or sin and wrongdoing, violating the laws of Allah in the material world, such as taking riba, you see, or using intoxicants or gambling, going to clubs and these types of things? Is it because we have put more emphasis on this dunya? Do we believe that this dunya is our paradise too, that it is not a prison? La ilaha illallah. When the Prophet said that this material world was a prison, this is to tell us that we have to incarcerate our hands. Our hands cannot touch what our desires may want to touch. Our eyes cannot look at what our desires may want our eyes to look at. Our feet cannot go where Allah has forbidden them to go. You see, our tongue cannot say those things that Allah has made unlawful for us. So as Muslims, we realize that this dunya for us, it is a place of restraint, a place where we must hold back our desires. But it is the paradise for the disbelievers. Why? Because they can do and say whatever they like. This is their enjoyment. This is their paradise. And it will be the only paradise that they will ever know. So we shouldn't be envious of what the disbelievers have. We know that Allah's mercy is comprised of 100 parts. And that mercy is divided into those 100 parts to show us a lesson. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that one one hundredth of his mercy is for the entire creation. That everything that we benefit from in this life, the food that we eat, the water that we drink, the clothing, the shelter, the means of conveyance, the wealth, all the things that bring us enjoyment represent only one one hundredth of his rahmah or his mercy. That is for the believer and the disbelievers alike. But the believers have a special favor in store for them with the other 99 parts that are being held in reserve by Allah for the akhirah, for the life in the hereafter. So let us not be so engrossed in chasing this material world because this material world will soon vanish. It is temporary at best. We see many, many people spend their whole lifetimes just accumulating wealth only to end their lives with much regret and great sorrow because they never found their true purpose in life. As Muslims, we must be slaves of Allah and not slaves of the dollar or slaves of the dinar. We have to be slaves of Allah and put this material world in its proper place. MashaAllah, we know from the saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that had this world been to Allah worth the weight of the wing of a mosquito, that he would not have even given those who reject him, those who reject faith, a mere sip of water. What does that tell us? It tells us that this material world is no more than the weight of a mosquito in the eyesight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So should we as Muslims be focusing all our time, wasting our time running after this material world? Sometimes we become so busy chasing the dollar or chasing our desires that we forget about Allah, we forget about the rights of Allah, we don't make salah, we don't get up for salah to fajr because we enjoy the sleep and the warmth of our beds, you see? We don't come to Salat al-Jum'ah because we enjoy the pursuit of wealth. We let our jobs become more important. You see, we have to be very, very careful when we have to stand up for the truth. In our homes, our family may want us to do something that is not in keeping with the Sharia, not in keeping with the laws of Allah. We have to be firm and let the family know that we must obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger even if it is against our own selves. Sometimes our children may want things that 
are not beneficial to them. We shouldn't just give in to their wants and desires, especially if we know that they may be harmful to them. MashaAllah Ta'ala, this dunya is very, very dangerous because it is filled with snares and traps that can cause us to go astray and forget about Allah. MashaAllah Ta'ala, one of the easiest ways to become destroyed and to lose in this life and in the hereafter is to forget Allah. And the material world is filled with things that will distract us and take us away from our responsibility to Allah and will cause us to leave our obligations to worship Allah. So dear brothers and sisters, let us remember that this dunya is no more than a prison for the believers even though it is a paradise for the disbelievers. Stay with us as we return in our discussion of the dangers of the dunya. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to our continuing discussion on the dangers of the dunya. We said earlier that the Prophet Muhammad, God's peace and blessings be upon him, informed us that this material world is a prison for the believer while it is a paradise for the disbeliever. Let us now look at some of the dangers that we must be on guard against. We know from the early scholars of our religion that among the dangers from this material world are our desires. The desires. Allah the Almighty has created in us natural desires that seek to be fulfilled, such as the desire of hunger, the desire to, to have our hunger fulfilled, the desire for intimacy with our mates, the desire to acquire wealth, the desire for all of the good things. However, these things will become a danger for us when we do not observe the rights of Allah, when we do not observe the limits that Allah has set for us. So we have to know that these things, while Allah has given us the natural desire for fulfillment in these areas, we must stay within the prescribed limits that Allah has ordained. For example, we know that food is a necessary part of our lives, the nourishment that we obtain from food, we must eat. However, Allah SWT has created the food and has told us which foods we must eat and which foods we must avoid. Among them, the flesh of the swine or the khanzir, any animals that have been killed or gored or died of itself or have been killed in a way of, that uh, is not prescribed by the sharia. We know that uh, certain beverages are forbidden, such as intoxicants, khamar, alcohol, and the like. So while these things may be classified as foods, we have to stay away from them or avoid them as Allah has commanded us to do. Because if we don't, then it will bring inherent harm to us. Allah the Almighty has placed in us the natural urge to procreate and to have intimacy with our spouses. However, we see in our society today that this desire has gone to the wildest extremes where we find premarital sex and sex out of wedlock is the common order of the day only to result in great harm and damage to society. This has been reflected in the growth of the divorce rate, in the birth of illegitimate or unwanted children, in the rapid increase of sexually transmitted diseases all as a result of our desires run amok and unchecked. Also from the dangers of this dunya, we find the desire to acquire wealth at, to great limits, knowing no limits on how much wealth one may accumulate. It doesn't matter how we attain or acquire that wealth, even if it means stepping on someone else or stepping over someone else or taking the wealth from someone else that doesn't rightfully belong to our, ourselves. These things are as a result of our desires out of control. So in Islam, we find a healthy check and balance on all of the desires that Allah has put in us so that we will use these desires as a means to get closer to Him. There's nothing wrong with the wealth. There's nothing wrong with lawful sexual relations. There's nothing wrong with the appetite for eating. But when we go to extremes 
And when we exceed the limits that Allah the Almighty has set, then these natural desires that he has given us become a great danger and harm for society. So we find in society the uncontrolled fulfillment of desires leads to much danger and destruction of the family. In Islam, we find a healthy expression and control of these desires. In Islam, our Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, has told us that when we eat, we should not eat to excess. We should fill the vessel with one-third food, one-third water or beverage, and one-third air. That we should never finish eating being so full that we can't eat anymore. We should leave the plate feeling as though we can eat more. In regards to the fulfillment of our sexual appetite, Almighty Allah has given us the institution of marriage to fulfill this necessary requirement in life. And for the man who has an appetite to procreate and to extend himself, he has the permission and the right to marry up to four women if he is able to provide for them justly. Also, wealth is something that every citizen and every nation needs. But Allah has given us a means to protect that wealth called zakat and sadaqah. And sadaqah is a means by which we may purify our wealth. So, if you want to acquire wealth and become rich, there's no blame in that. As long as you remember the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you and the rights of his slaves, that they are entitled to a share of your wealth through zakah and through sadaqah. Now let us turn to another of the dangers of the dunya, and that is the danger of doubt. Doubt is something that is given to us by the enemy of Allah and the enemy of the human being called shaitan. It is a state of mind that reflects uncertainty in what one believes in or what one knows. If you want to be a doctor, a successful doctor, you must have certainty. You wouldn't go into an operating room not being sure of what you're going to do. No patient will be confident to lay under your knife for an operation to be performed if he knew that you doubted yourself. In Islam, we say that doubt forms one of the diseases of the heart. And doubt comes about as a result of the lack of information, the lack of correct knowledge. When we doubt, it means that we're not sure of what we stand upon or what we say we believe in. And in Islam, our faith is established upon certainty because there's no blind following in Islam. We have not come to this way of life simply because it was given to us and we accepted hook, line, and sinker. We used our rational intelligence and our logical thinking to come to the conclusion that Islam was the best way for us. So for this reason, we don't ever allow doubt to interfere or to, to be entertained in our minds. Because the moment we begin to doubt what we say we believe in will be the moment that the shaitan or the enemy of Allah and his humanity will have gained the victory and the upper hand over us. So we must be careful and on guard against desires and against doubt. Doubt are a result of misinformation and untruths. And our society today is filled with many untruths or lies that have created doubt. Many people doubt religion because they have been taught lies throughout their lives. They doubt the governing systems because they see politicians lead duplicitous or hypocritical lives. So we have to be on guard against these dangers from the dunya, desires, and doubts, because they lead to the destruction of our hearts, and they can separate us from the source from which we take everything, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a Muslim, we must always remember the advice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and 
to live in this world as a stranger or as a wayfarer, only passing through. The Prophet ﷺ said, Kun fi dunya al gharib o abri sabir. To be in this material world as a passerby or as a wayfarer, as a stranger, one who doesn't get too attached to his surroundings. Because when we leave here, when we return to Allah, ultimately, we will only return to Allah alone. We won't be able to take the wealth with us. We won't be able to take our spouses with us. We won't be able to take the food and the, the enjoyments with us. We will return to Allah alone. So why get attached to these things that in themselves will return to dust? Are we nothing more than dust, chasing dust? No, Allah has created us to be the Khalifa, the successors and the vicegerents, the custodian of this creation. But we are not to become slaves of this creation. MashaAllah Ta'ala. Let us reflect on the life of the great companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who were not swayed by the snares and the entrapments of this material life. MashaAllah, we find that many of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the time when Islam had become the dominant way of life in civilization, that they themselves, they shunned the wealth. They did not allow themselves to be overtaken by their appetite or their greed or their lust for material things. And this is the one thing that the Prophet Sallallahu he warned his ummah against. He feared that we as Muslims would become too wealthy and, and overtaken by affluence. And we find that this is exactly what happened that caused the demise of the Muslim nations. We call to mind the time when the great trial of civilization, the Tatars or the Mongols, came as hordes throughout the civilization uh, at that time, destroying all that laid ahead of it. And when they came to the Muslim nations, they caused the rulers of the Muslims to melt their gold and to drink it. Why? Because the Muslims had begun to forget about Allah and to put the dunya ahead of Allah. We cannot allow to do this, allow ourselves to put the dunya before deen. So we have a choice to make. Let us not become so attracted and in love with this material world that we forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is more important and what is more lasting. This material world is nothing compared to what Allah has promised us in the hereafter as a, re as a reward for our good deeds. Let us remember that this dunya has been created as a test for us to see which of us will be best in conduct. We cannot take it with us. When we die and return to Allah, everything that we earn will be turned back to our families. Our property and our wealth will go back to our families. We won't be able to take any of it with us. So how shall we utilize our time? By increasing in the doing of good deeds. These are the possessions that we will take with us to our graves and to the eventual day of judgment and standing before Allah. So increase in the doing of good deeds and lower your attraction and your desire for this dunya. Thank you for being with us in our discussion on the dangers of the dunya. Please join us again next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.